this evening, that you've allowed us to come together, oh God, and seek your face one more time. Lord, you've brought us a mighty long way, and we're grateful for it. As we celebrate on this Mother's Day, oh God, we look back and we look over our lives and we say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for those matriarchs, those women, those leaders that have shaped us, they've molded us, they've counseled us, they've covered us, they've prayed for us, and they've been on bending knee for us. And we thank you, God, for the gift that we call mamas. Father, as we proclaim your word today, as we seek your face today, we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit and let your word fall afresh on us this morning. For Lord, if we don't hear from you, God, what shall we do? Now, Lord, take this feeble preacher and use me one more time for my good and your glory, that you may get all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, we pray this morning, and we all say, amen. Good morning, Word First family. Hey, I hope everybody enjoyed breakfast and everything. Um, hey, I, give it up for the brothers. We, 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 they did an awesome job. Listen. We were up here yesterday and then early this morning. You know, I got my chop on. Brother Walt gave me a job. I got two supervisors, Brother Walt. <laughs> Brother Walt was my supervisor. Then I had Brother Marcus supervising me, and I thought they was going to fire me for a minute, but they let me work. They let me work. So, hey, they did. They, it was awesome. So um, thank you, brothers, for all you do. And sisters, thank you so much for turning out. There's a word from the Lord this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, if you would open your word to the, to the book of Genesis. Genesis 16 is where we're going to go this morning. Genesis 16. Genesis 16. If you have it, say amen. If you don't, say wait for me. If you still don't have it, don't tell nobody. See pastor after church. If you can't find Genesis, don't tell nobody. All right, Genesis 16, I'm going to read it from the New International Version of the Bible. If you have it, would you please stand in reverence for the reading of the Word of God? One of the brothers asked me, why do I always ask people to stand for the reading of the Word? Well, on the one hand, um, that's how we reverence God. That's how they did it in, you know, when we're going to synagogues. But number two, because I have a lot of frat brothers and people in seminary that I keep in contact with, and they always ask me, how did church go? I will always say, brother, I had them standing on their feet. Uh, <laughs> All right, Genesis 16, NIV, and it reads thusly, Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah had said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan ten years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abram, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between me and you, between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarah mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near the spring in the desert. It was the spring that was, beside, that was beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah. She answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant, and you will give birth to a son. His name, you shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. 
That is why the well is called Beer Lahoy Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Beer. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son, had, to the son she had born. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. This is the word of God for the people of God. Before you take your seat, shout the title to your neighbor, The Qualities of a Magnificent Mother. You may be seated in God's presence. The Qualities of a Magnificent Mother. There's an old adage that says, and some sister will probably be able to find an amen in this old adage, and it says, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Through that old adage, the hand that rocks the cradle that rules the world, we understand that mothers have a certain impact on the lives of their children. Mothers have a way of shaping societies, shaping cultures, shaping nations by how they raise their children. I don't care how big you are, how bad you are, how tough you think you are. There is something about the power of a mother to get you to change your perspective. There is something about a mother that can take the strongest of us and make us rethink who we are, what we're doing, and what we intend to do in a certain circumstance and a situation. The hand that rocks the cradle shapes the world. I know that's a good word this morning, and somebody can testify that when somebody else can't get through to you, when your friends can't get you to see reason, when your spouse can't get you to see reason, if you got a good mother, a show sure enough good mother, somebody can pick up that phone and say your mother's on the other end, and that person will relent, change their mind, change their heart, change their trajectory on what they're about to do. The hand that rocks the cradle has a tendency to rule the world. There is something about the power of a mother. The, the term and the title mom is so revered. It's revered, it's respected, it's honored, it's celebrated. The title mother is more respected than even the title president. The title mother is so honored more than even king. The title mother is even more feared than the phrase your honor. The title mother is even more celebrated than Father's Day. Some brother should have clapped and said amen right there because you know you ain't never had a problem getting a brunch reservation on Father's Day. <laughs> Mothers are always more celebrated than daddies. You got to understand word first, and I've told you this before. I come up in an era and a generation where as boys, we did all kind of games. We played games called Killer Man. That's where you take a football and throw it up in the air, and whoever catches it better run for their life because everybody's out to kill him. We played games called bailout when you're in a swing and swinging back and forth to see how high you could go and whoever could jump out the highest and the furthest, that's who won. We played games like that. We played games like Red Rover, Red Rover, let Chanel Dupree come over. We played games li like that. But there was one game you had no business playing. Two words you bet not put together when you playing games. You could talk about somebody's daddy all you wanted to. You could talk about somebody's clothes, somebody's shoes, but you better not put together yo. Oh, y'all played that game too, I see. Because when you talk about somebody's mama, it'll make you go up that side of their head on one side and have to come down on the other. You don't talk about my because mama is revered. And mama, there is something special about somebody's mama. Most women will tell you it's not the birthing pains that drive them and propel them and turn them into a mama. The birthing part, that's the easy part. But it's those years after those years that, that frustrate you, those years that make you really come to Jesus, those years that force you into prayer, those years that make you counsel, that cause you to be a guide. Mama, if you pull up your resume right now, what's on your mama's resume? Doctor, lawyer, counselor, guidance. 
All those things go to nurturer. All those roles you fill as mama. You nurture, you pray, you guide, you love, you comfort, you direct. That's why the term mama is not just limited to those who have given physical birth. Because the noun mom only applies to a few biologically. But the verb mama applies to every woman. There is something in her DNA genetic makeup that makes her who she is. And maybe, just maybe, in our society, in our culture, or some maybe, just maybe, divinely, God had just built that into women. Why is it that when we think about it, we train little girls from an early age, we buy them what? Their favorite doll. They learn nurturing at an early age. The term mama is that term that there are some women that don't that haven't given birth to their own kids but then again there are some aunties some cousins some sisters some sister that has actually deposited and influenced your life in such a way that you wouldn't be the person you are if it hadn't have been for a sister that stepped up and stepped in and helped you out along the way some sister that told you to pull your pants up straighten up your tie watch how you talk to people watch how you carry yourself some sister that deposited something into you your life. Some mother that had a quality that reminded you, you are more than what you are doing right now. You are more than who you are right now. There is greatness within you, and I am committed to seeing you be great. There is something about the qualities of a good mother. I thank God for my mother. As Pastor said, my mother is still here. I thank God for my mother, for all that she sacrificed, for all that she gave, for all that she did for me. Even when I was unlovable, even when I embarrassed her, even when I embarrassed my family, even when I did things I had no business doing, she never quit. She never gave up. She sacrificed. She worked two jobs. She went from bell to bell to make sure that we had. She sacrificed. And the qualities of a good mother are those that can sacrifice. Is there any sister in the house that can testify that I sacrificed? You gave up what you wanted so they can have what they need? That brother may have been good for you, but been bad for them, and you sacrificed that relationship? You gave up the bins and drove the Buick so that they could have you worked two jobs and still showed up to parent-teacher conferences. You showed up because the qualities of a good mother, you invest in the lives of your babies. There's a sister in the Bible, one of the most powerful sisters in the Bible that doesn't get no credit. A good mother, strong and powerful, but she doesn't get any play. I know I'm right about it because here's a sister in the Bible, her name is Hagar, but we know that she doesn't get any play because when you think about biblical names and biblical names that you give your girls, all of us in here may know some Ruths, some Leahs, some Naomi's. If you're black, you show enough knowing Esther. But nowhere do you find too many people named Hagar. And ashamedly so, because Hagar is a sister that is extremely powerful. A sister that found out who she is and found out what she stood for and found out what God had planned for her life and decided to take a stand and move in a direction that God sent her to move. A powerful sister. Oh, and if you never heard about Hagar, let me tell you a little bit about Sister Hagar's story. Can I run her story down to you really fast? Sister Hagar, her story starts right a little bit before chapter 16, what we read today. Hagar's story starts back with Abraham. God shows up on the scene with Abraham and says, hey, Abe, I'm going to bless you. I want you to get away from your father and everything you know, and I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to do something with you I ain't done before with nobody else. I'm going to show up, show out. I want you to step outside and look up in the sky, count the stars. And if you can count all the stars, that's not even what I'm about to do for your seed. 
I'm going to make you a mighty nation. He makes Abraham a promise. Abraham has a promise, but his wife Sarah has a problem. Abraham has a promise. Sarah has a problem. Sarah's problem is that now she is older in age. She's been barren. She's never had a child. And to add insult to injury, she's post-menopause. If you're a woman that's sitting next to a woman, tap on the shoulder and tap on the knee and say, look, that's a problem. <laughs> Abraham has a promise. Sarah has a problem. So since Sarah has a problem, but Abraham has a problem, Abraham has a promise, Sarah begins to plan. And isn't it funny that whenever our problems meet God's promises, we begin to start planning. She started to make a plan to say, I want to help God out. Allow me to pause here parenthetically and let you know that whenever you decide that you need to help God out, you've already negated God's promise. God was God before you got here, and he's going to be here after you leave here. God don't need your help to fix any plans. Abraham has a promise. She has a problem, so she begins to plan. Hey, listen, God taking too long. I got an Egyptian slave. I'm sorry, uh, some of us are geographically challenged, an African slave, because most people will tell you or forget to let you know that Egypt is in Africa, so in other words, I have an African slave. I got an African slave. I'm going to give her to you. And under the laws of slavery in those days, whatever she has is mine. She belongs to me, and whatever comes from her belongs to me. I'm going to give her to you, and if she has a baby, that baby going to be mine, and that's how we're going to help God out. Take my slave, sleep with her, and maybe you can have a baby. Abraham don't need too much convincing. <laughs> Abraham don't need too much convincing. He gets with, he hooks up with Hagar. She gets pregnant. And when she gets pregnant, all hell breaks loose. Sarah gets upset and says, hey, you did all of this. I put my, I put my slave in your arms and now she despises me. Brothers, one of the gifts that women have is finding a way to take any situation that comes up and making you think it's your fault and you feel guilty behind it. Some brother ought to say amen. Some brother. That brother back there talking about, uh, mm, I got to go home with her. I got to go home. You on your own, preacher. You on your own. <laughs> she, she, she gets mad. She says because Sarah is not looking at her the same way Sarah despises. Hagar, Sarah says, Hagar despises me. All this is your fault, Abraham. Abraham comes to the point and says, well, hey, Sarah, you know what? She's your slave. She's in your hand. Do whatever you want to do. As a consequence, Abraham has given up everything. He's pushed it to the side. And the Bible says that now Sarah has started to mistreat Hagar. He starts, she starts to mistreat her. Abraham has a promise. Sarah has a problem. So Sarah comes up with the plan. She gives her slave to her husband. Abraham consents. We don't know if Hagar consents. Because under the rules of slavery, she doesn't have the right to say no. But if she does not consent, that's rape. That's rape. We don't know if she consents. Professor Will Gaffney, Old Testament theologian and scholar, she argues that Hagar is a womb slave, meaning that her womb is controlled by Sarah. Ain't it a shame to live in a world where somebody else's womb is controlled by somebody else? You'll catch that when you get home. Her womb is controlled by somebody else. Abram consents, but we don't know if she does. So Hagar gets pregnant, and now 
the Bible says that she begins to look down at or dis she, she looks at her mistress, she doesn't look at her mistress the same way. God shows up after she gets pregnant, her mistress starts mistreating her, she bounces. She dips out and she leaves. Then God meets her in the desert right where she is. Hagar, where are you coming from and where are you going? Hagar, I want you to understand, I know that this ain't how you wanted this to go down. I want you to know that I know that this ain't what you've been feeling, but I want you to know you are not excused from this plan. I still got my hands on your life. I still got something for you. Just because you have been mistreated, I still got you. Just because you have made been raped, I still got you. You are not disqualified because you're a slave. You are not disqualified because you're an African. You are not disqualified because some bad stuff has happened to you. I got you. And don't somebody need to hear that this morning? No matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, no matter how bad life has been, God shows up and says, I got you. And God has some mothers that he uses that no matter how it feels when you're by yourself, no matter how much you sacrifice, you can make it. You can get through this. God says, I got you. He tells her, I got you. But notice what happens. This, 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 this sister is such a bad sister that she, there are some things that God puts in Hagar. I would argue that there is something about Hagar that attracts God. There is something about Hagar that made God take a second look. There is something about Hagar that made God shop, shortstop her on that road and ask her where she's going. God saw something in Hagar that Hagar needs to share it with you. Some qualities of a magnificent mother. Look, look, look at what happened. Hagar, Hagar, God sees something in Hagar that we just really need to talk about. She gets pregnant. Sarah gets mad at Abraham. She blames Abraham. Then she begins to mistreat Sarah. Then she begins to mistreat Hagar. Hagar, it says, despises Sarah. This word despise in Hebrew, it's a little bit ambiguous, but what we discern when we look at this in the academy is that it's based on how she's looking, how Hagar's looking at Sarah. When you were a slave in those days, you didn't look at the master eye to eye. You, you looked at them or you talked to them with, you know what, uh, uh, yes, master, I get it for you. Uh, yes, master, you don't give eye to eye contact. But now that Hagar is pregnant, she's looking at her in a different way. And Sarah don't like the way that Hagar is looking at her. So Sarah doesn't like the way Hagar is looking at her, so she goes off. She gets upset. Only one of two things are plausible at this point. Number one, either Hagar has disrespected Sarah by bringing her down to slave level and she's looking at her eye to eye. Because you know, privilege is always hating when they think that we're equal. Privilege always has an issue when you make yourself equal to privilege. Privilege likes to be here, and that's fine, but when you meet privilege eye to eye, it's problematic. So, number one, either, Sarah, either Hagar has brought Sarah down to slave level, disrespecting her, or, number two, Hagar has raised herself up to Sarah's level, and she's looking at her eye to eye. Could it be that Sarah, after she, that Hagar, after she's gotten pregnant, has decided to take a long look at herself and said, baby, I'm more than what they think I am. There is something in me that Sarah didn't see. I'm beautifully and wonderfully made. I'm more than what you see right now. I got plans. I got an agenda. God has his hands on my life. Have you ever looked at yourself and said you're more than what you are right now? She looked at herself and she raised herself up. She reevaluated who she was and where she was. Her value has went up. 
And there's a, something in every woman's life where you have got to begin to evaluate yourself, to reevaluate yourself, to look at yourself, and to take a second look and say, I am more than what they thought I was. I am more than what you said I was. There comes a moment in everyone's life where you've got to see something in yourself that nobody has ever seen before. You've got to believe in yourself like nobody has ever believed before. You've got to embrace yourself like nobody has ever embraced you before. You've got to be able to see something in you that nobody else ever has. Sister girl, sister friend, you've got to be able to look at yourself and know that you are beautifully and wonderfully made. You got to look in the mirror and tell yourself you got it going on. You need to look in the mirror and tell yourself how fine you are. You need to be able to tell yourself that you're worthy and that you're worth it. You've got to be able to tell yourself something good. You got to be able, sister, I'm telling you, you got to be able to look at yourself and know that you're special. The qualities of a magnificent mother. That's why I love some Hagar, because Hagar says, I'm more than what you thought I was. Shame on that sister that needs a brother to validate her. Shame on that sister that needs a brother to tell you that you're fine and that you're pretty and that you're worth something. You need to be able to be comfortable and happy with who you are first. If you tore up from the floor up, why are you bringing somebody else into all your mess? You need to learn to be at peace and love you first before you drag somebody else into that mess. Because I'm here to tell you, if you leave me, I'm going to be all right. I'm comfortable with who I am. And that's what we need. I think that's what God wants us to have some women that model. You got to be okay with being alone. You got to be okay with just being by yourself. You got to be okay with just being you. Because if God has already called you, if God has already validated you, it don't matter what no devil, no demon, no brother in hell says about you. Hagar says, I'm out of here. I love what she does. Hagar dips on him. The Bible says that she begins to despise Sarah, Sarah begins to mistreat her, and she leaves. She's being mistreated, and she leaves. I ain't going to take this no more, Pastor. I done had enough. You ain't going to talk to me like that. You ain't going to treat me like that. You ain't going to put your hands on me like that. I'm out of here. In other words, like Fannie Lou Hamer, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And Papa would put it like this, I done had all I can stand and I can't stand no more. Hagar is able to dip because she knows who she is. And when you know who you are, there's only so much you'll put up with. You just ain't going to put up with any and every old thing. But not only that, not only does she know who she is, number two, just really quickly here, you got to know whatever God has called you to do in your life, you can do it. You know who she is. She knows who she is. She won't let people talk to her any other kind of way. And whatever God has called you to do, she's able to fulfill it. God finds you, finds her right where she is, and God gives her a prophecy. Hagar, listen, go back to Sarah. But at the same time, I want you to submit to her. Also, I'm going to multiply your seed. I'm going to make your descendants numerable as the stars in the sky. He gives Hagar the same thing that he gave to Abraham. I'm not showing up to you, Hagar, because of who Abraham is. I'm not showing up because you want to help Sarah out. I'm showing up because of who you are. What I'm about to do in your life, it's going to bless you. What I'm about to do in your life, it's going to fulfill you. I got a plan for you. He has a plan for her life. And notice what happens. He gives her this prophecy. He says, hey, you about to have a baby. And this boy is going to be a handful. This boy is going to make you pray. This boy is going to make you fast even when the church ain't fasting. Oh, not my first child, but, but that last child, that, oh, that 16-year-old makes you want to pray. Oh, but really quick, I know I'm running out of time, but let me tell you this story. So I'm on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. 
While I'm on Facebook, uh, my, my daughter has gotten me tore up from the floor. Up. She's got me stressed out. So I'm on Facebook, and I see this sister on Facebook. This chick is on Facebook, and she's giving a personal testimony. She's giving a testimony and said, hey, I can remember when I was younger. I was sneaking out the house. I was doing this, and I was doing that. And my parents caught me and took the door off my, my, took the door off my room. But they didn't give up on me. They prayed me through it. They helped me through it. And now things are still good. I text that sister, I DM that sister, I said, man, thank you for that. I'm going through some things right now, and I really want to appreciate you. And this is what the sister clapped back with. On the, on the, she DM me back, and this is what she said. Don't worry about that. God got her, and God got you. There's something about a woman that can model what we need. And from that day until this one, whenever I feel that my back's against the wall, I show up and I pray for my baby. I have to remember that she's going to go through some things. She's going to experience some things. And we're going to make it through. Because that sister told me, God got her and God got you. And while we in church this morning, let me throw on blast and say, thank you, Chanel. Anyway, that's how I would tell You have to be able to model what it looks like for your kids. He says, hey, he says Abraham, she says, Hagar, this boy is going to be a handful. But since he's going to be a handful, you're going to have to teach him how to get respect. Just like you left that house because you were disrespected, you're going to have to teach Ishmael how to be respected. Because Ishmael's going to be a wild man. Everybody going to fight Ishmael. Everybody's going to argue with Ishmael. Everybody's going to have their hand against them, and he's going to be against them, and they're going to be against him. But everything he's going to go through, he's going to have to learn how to have a backbone. He's going to have to learn to have a backbone. He's going to have to learn how to be respected. He's going to have to learn not to let people treat him any old kind of way. He's going to learn what it means to be a man. And maybe, just maybe, that's what God's role is. He's going to learn all of that from his mama. Ooh, He's going to learn all of that from his mama. Abraham won't be here to help you out because Abraham is scared of Sarah. So since Abraham ain't going to be able to step up and help you out, you're going to have to do this on your own. But girl, I got you. I got you. Don't you worry about it. Don't you fret. Don't you trip. I got you. And that's what happens in this story. He says that Ishmael is going to be a handful and everything he's going to learn, he's going to learn it from his mama. Is there anybody in here that thanks God for the mama that trained you, the God mama that taught you, the mama that helped you get along the way, the mama that gave you principles? Oh, I still hear my grandmother, even my, even my wife now tells, tells Tracy, she tells Naya, you don't carry yourself like that. Women don't carry themselves like that. You train up a child in a way to go, a good mother. That's why we should be careful running down single mamas. Because just because you're a single mama, you can do it. Just because you're a single mama, you ain't disqualified. God still has plans for you. God still has his hands on your life. And I know we demonize people. And we say stuff like, you know, it takes a man to raise a boy. No, I don't. There are some sisters that are doing the dang on thing. There's some sisters that are doing it. That's why, I mean, I, that's why I have a big issue when we see, we see people in interpartner, uh, violent, uh, violent romances, violent relationships. You stay in a relationship that's abusive, that's physically abusive, that's mentally abusive, and you put it under the banner, I'm doing it to stay on, keep my family together. No, you ain't. Because you ain't keeping your family together. What you're teaching your children is how to be disrespected. Hagar, this boy's going to be wild, but you got this. Go back home, submit to Sarah. And if God gives you the vision, he'll tell you what you need to do to carry it out. Look at what she says, and I know this is how I know God blessed it. He gave her a prophecy about her son. He sends her back home. When he sends her back home, he tells her that, this right here is going to be all right. Notice, if you will, she goes back home, 
There is nowhere else in Scripture we see where Sarah was mistreating her. Ooh, come here. He tells her to go back home, go back to that toxic situation, go back to that hellified situation, and I'm going to handle everything else. You ain't got to fight about it. You ain't got to argue about it. You ain't got to cuss nobody out. All you got to do is do what I told you to do. And if God has given you the vision, if God has given you the power, then you can walk and trust in what God has already said. You need to learn to walk on a word. Are there any word walkers in the building this morning? You got to learn to walk on a word. She goes back. She follows God's plan. And she trusts in the Lord. Here's, here's the thing. She gets back there. And you know what happened. I know what happened. Y'all know how it happened. Y'all know what happened. She get in the house. Abraham and Sarah in there around the campfire watching some TV. Maybe they're on black Twitter. She says, Abe, Sarah, we need to talk. God told me to come back. And I want y'all to know, ain't going to be no mistreating me around here. Something got to change. Brother, brother, brothers, brothers. Really quick, if you ever see your wife and she's doing like this, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. That's a good place just to be quiet. She makes a decision that some things have got to change. We ain't gonna be, you ain't going to be mistreating me. You ain't going to be talking to me like that. And you ain't going to be carrying, your, you ain't going to be putting your hands on me like that. Whatever the case may be, we need, God is looking for women that are mature women of God. You got to learn how to deal with a real woman of God. A real woman of God tells you that you ain't going to talk to me no any kind of way. A real woman of God, watch your mouth when you talk to me. A real woman of God, you ain't going to be putting your hands on me. When you deal with a real woman of God, the atmosphere changes. There is something different and distinct when you deal with a real woman of God. Brothers, 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 brothers. The Bible says that she names God, an African sister names God, everybody else names the place, but only one place in Bible, somebody names God. She says, you are the God that has seen me and the God that I see. In the Old Testament, you couldn't see God casually. Moses couldn't see him. Jacob wrestled at night. Isaiah said even the angels covered their face because you just don't see God casually. But this sister comes up and says, I've seen him and he's seen me. But, Sarah, but Hagar, you're still alive. Because Sarah, Hagar has found out that this God is able to protect her from things that should have killed her. Oh, baby girl, sister friend, that which should have killed you, that that should have took you out, that should have held you down and held you over. God has protected you. God spared you. God made a way out of no way for you. God showed up. And bro ooh, last point right here, brothers, 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 sisters, close your ears. Brothers, brothers, this is for y'all. Let me help you out. The most dangerous woman you can try to hook up with is a woman who knows God will take care of her. Ooh, the most dangerous sister you can try to hook up with is a sister that's found out that God will take care of her, that God will bring her through, that God will help her out because that's what Hagar did. God brought her out, God brought her through, and she's confident now. No matter if Abraham stays by my side, no matter what comes my way, come hell or high water, I trust in God. You got to be able to know who God is in your life. Know that God will take care of you. Know that God will fight your battles. And that just can't be rhetoric. That's got to be the personification of who you are and how you carry yourself. Knowing that God will. Is there any sister in the building that know that God will take care of you? He will take care of you. She goes back home. She has the baby. And the Bible says she puts the baby in Abram's arms. Hmm. Abram in the Old Testament is the dad. He has the right to name the baby whatever he wants. She gives the baby to Abraham. Abraham names him Ishmael. Abram wasn't in the desert, so how does he know what to name the baby? 
Hagar told him. Where did Hagar get the name from? From God. Hagar has the power to go home and get her house in order. In other words, she met God in the desert and took the word home with her. Hagar says, not only am I going to do what God says, but we all going to do what God says. Don't leave the word at church. Take the word home with you. Sister, I know you've been wanting him to come to church with you. I know you've been wanting him to come to Bible study with you. I know you've been wanting him to fellowship with you. But if he don't come because he's watching the game, take the word home with him. Take the word home to your family. Preach this sermon to each and every last one of them. Preach it until they hear it. Preach it until they feel it. Preach it until they come to church with you. And tell your neighbor, girl, he's serious too. He's serious too. Preach the word and don't leave it in the sanctuary. May God bless you. May God keep you a model of magnificent motherhood. motherhood. <laughs>